distinguished colleagues, uh, distinguished guests. You cannot imagine how great honor it is for me to stand here because the auditorium is named after my very hometown, little Diosdjer, which is actually the historical um, point of my, my uh, hometown, Miskolc, uh, in northern eastern Hungary. And I think uh, you as professors uh, from Europe, uh, especially from Central Europe, uh, you are here and we are talking about the future of Europe, the past and the future of Europe, but still uh, our dedication to our roots, to our history, is actually symbolized by the very name of this uh, room. So thank you very much for being with us. Uh, you are the uh, reality uh, of our dream, uh, what we dreamt uh, of four years ago when we started to establish uh, a network of professors coming from Central Europe, uh, invite them to think together about our beloved Europe, about the future, and whenever, especially from here Hungary, we are criticizing this beautiful concept, it's not uh, against uh, this concept, it's for the better sake and better future of that concept. So in this spirit, I would like to open uh, my speech uh, and to give some keynote thoughts for further uh, common thinking during the conference. And again, thank you for this beautiful organization. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, let me start by a quotation from an American basketball coach. He said, without proper self-evaluation, failure is inevitable. Anniversaries are perfect occasions, both in case of private persons and institutions, to carry out such a necessary self-assessment. The entry into force of the Maastricht Treaty 30 years ago offers such kind of an opportunity for the European Union and its member states. The current and long-term challenges we are facing from the war in Ukraine through the energy crisis and inflation till the pressing issue of sustainability make this self-evaluation even more indispensable today. Conferences like the event today, which combine historic, institutional, political and policy aspects of EU integration can efficiently support this endeavor. In this spirit, I thank the Central European Academy and the Ferenc Madol Institute of Comparative Law for organizing the conference. The ladies and gentlemen, when I, as an outgoing Minister of Justice, actually, because I just uh, resigned yesterday uh, with the effect uh, at the end of July for the uh, better uh, and in a position to be prepared for the next European elections, but I think there's a lot of at stake for all of us especially in Central Europe, but still uh, in my capacity also in charge of EU affairs, or my outgoing capacity for EU affairs, let's say, and as a politician, I shall give an overview of the Maastricht Treaty. My main questions are the followings. What were the original intentions of the creation of the European Union? Second, did we manage to achieve these goals? Is there any malfunctioning? How can we make our community more resilient and fit for the future. And in my introductory speech, I will intend to summarize the cornerstones of the Hungarian government's EU politics along the main novelties of the Maastricht Treaty and these questions. The name of Maastricht has become almost a synonym for the European Union. The treaty, signed in 1992 in line with its preamble and Article A, was the beginning of a new phase in the process of creating the infamous ever closer union among the peoples of Europe in which decisions are taken as closely as possible to the citizen in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity. This is a very, very difficult word to pronounce, even in English and even in Hungarian, but subsidiarity, we often quote this, so we have to just repeat it. Nowadays, we often hear the first part of this sentence, ever closer union. The first element of this intention, the creation of the deepening ever closer union from today's leading EU officials and politicians. However, the second element, is unfortunately being more and more neglected. Because the second phrase was to bring decisions as closely as possible to the citizens in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity. We do believe that both elements of this sentence in the Maastricht Treaty should be equally uh, respected during our everyday functioning. And it is undeniable that the Treaty of Maastricht gave a political dimension to the previous economic cooperation. The treaty laid the foundations for economic and monetary union the single currency, the euro, and the criteria for its use provided the legal basis for six new EU common policies. I wouldn't list those six uh, common policies because you know it by heart. 
But while there is no doubt that the member states' intention was to further deepen their partnership, it was also clear from the text of the treaty that the aim of an ever closer union cannot be an end in itself. The principle of conferral, the reference to the principle of subsidiarity, which was, by the way, defined for the first time on normative level in this treaty, and the principle of proportionality were also included. They shall ensure that a the community shall act within the limits of the powers conferred upon by this treaty and of the objective assigned to it therein. B. In areas which do not fall within its exclusive competence, the community shall take action only if and in so far as the objectives of the proposed action cannot be sufficiently achieved by the member states and can therefore, by reason of the scale or effects of the proposed action, be better achieved by the community. And finally, C. Any action by the community shall not go beyond what is necessary to achieve the objectives of this treaty. These formulations show that the member states were not only determined to extend their cooperation, but also they were determined to safeguard that EU-level decisions reflect the will and good of their citizens, but these are not made over the heads of the citizens and their democratically elected representatives. And what do we see now? Under the pretext of the concept of the ever closer union, decisions fundamentally affecting our societies are taken without respecting the will of considerable groups of citizens, almost whole nations. When the EU institutions decide about the new rules of migration, for example, as they are willing to impose mechanisms equaling compulsory allocation quotas on member states, they simply ignore that, for example, in Hungary, a large part of the society denied quota mechanism at a referendum or that the Constitutional Court held that the Hungarian state shall be obliged to ensure the protection of the right to identity of persons living in the territory of Hungary, or that a similar temporary mechanism already failed a couple of years ago, as it was not executed even by those countries which voted for it. Do we remember the 2015 quota decisions? The example of the minority safe pack shows also that currently a simple citizen's initiative to protect the rights of national minorities on EU level can be basically left unconsidered by the institutions. We witness that while for the sake of solidarity, all member states accepted the Recovery and Resilience Plan or facility, RRF, and the obligations stemming from it, we also ratified it for the sake of unity, for the sake of solidarity. Already three years ago, there are still two countries Poland and Hungary, whose citizens have not yet received any penny from these common financial resources. From these examples, it can be confirmed that the European Union tends to view integration as an end in itself, which precedes all traditional values and overrides national interest. The intention to create a European empire prevails without any mandate from the member states and European citizens. And this attitude, and here comes my point, can endanger the success of the whole European project because in several areas, especially in those closely linked to the social structures, national traditions and identities, the common EU approach will lead to less durable, less accepted and therefore less efficient solutions. And at the end of the day, the impracticable, alienated and unexecuted decisions will result in disintegration endangering the whole European project. Because if a measure is against the basic interest of a nation, they will just not implement it in practice. And then this will lead us to more and more infringement cases, more and more judgments, and more and more disintegration. I think the greatest symbol of this trend started in 2016 with Brexit. And I just happened to come from the Council of Europe, uh, where I signed yesterday the Budapest Convention against cybercrime. But on the sidelines, actually, I could uh, meet some officials of the Council of Europe. And I think we still have some hope for the better sake of Europe in the Council of Europe project, where still intergovernmentalism and the respect for supreme member state prevails. And they also said that Brexit was the first sign. And unfortunately, the lessons learned from Brexit by the greatest member states were not the exact lessons which should have been drawn. Because now what they did afterwards, it's, uh, it's just leading to more and more disintegration. Brexit was a very good sign for all of us that if we are over uh, exaggerate, exaggerating with the ever closer union concept, it will uh, lead us to uh, a looser and a more designated European Union. 
And for us, Central European countries, I do believe, and now I'm only talking on behalf of the Hungarian government, that the UK was our big brother uh, when it comes how to uh, represent our interests and the community about the optimal level of European integration. Whenever I met a British diplomat, they always said, this is too much Europe for me, this is okay, I want opt-out here, I can have opt-in here. So we really miss them because they were a great power, we are smaller here, and uh, they also understand and understood when they were members uh, in the community, the European position of the Central European countries. So here we should reinforce uh, our powers and our political weight to represent this optimal level of European integration for the sake of the European project. So the Hungarian government, in line with the provisions of the fundamental law, the will of the citizens formulated through referenda and elections, and consultation processes carried out among others in the framework of the Conference of the Future of Europe, considers integration as a tool that contributes to enhancing our national freedom. We believe that the member states are the masters of the future of the European integration. The member states are the sole holders of sovereignty, so it is for the member states alone to decide which competencies they wish to exercise collectively. In line with the original idea of an ever closer union, a concept coupled with that of subsidiarity, we should strive for deeper integration only in those areas where it has added value. We shall create a smarter Europe together, not a deeper, but a smarter Europe together. Giving a concrete example, currently the European Union is intending to building a Europe without Europeans. It is only providing financial support for mass immigration, while all the member states are obliged to bear the financial and social burden of this model due to the various EU policies. The EU does not recognize the risk that mass immigration poses to the European way of life, our culture, our tradition, our security and our values. However, when we are striving for financial support from European funding for family policy, we just uh, meet uh, shut doors. So we, on the other hand, see the future of Europe in supporting families and encouraging childbearing. We can do it on the basis of our sovereign policy. And the EU must recognize that this model also is a legitimate solution and therefore there should be support to it. This is why it's the utmost priority of the incoming Hungarian and I might say also the trio presidency to put demography on the table because there is a demographic challenge for Europe. And based on the Hungarian uh, position about European integration, we do not want to force our own ideas on other member states because we left them uh, the freedom of choosing the correct policy mix, which is appropriate to their, their identity, to their national economy, etc. But we also would like to be respected when we think that the demographic challenges should be tackled, uh, for example, with family policy, encouraging young couples uh, to have children. And this statement leads over to my second remark, dear ladies and gentlemen, on the issue of unity and diversity of our societies. The novelty of the Maastricht Treaty that most directly affected and affects the citizens was the creation of the so-called EU citizenship. The Treaty on European Union aimed to strengthen the protection of the rights and interests of the nationals of its member states through the introduction of a citizenship of the Union. From this formulation, it is clear that the rights granted by the EU legal order, for example, to travel and live freely anywhere you want in the EU, to vote and stand as a candidate in European election and local election in the country in which you live, or diplomatic assistance and protection by other member countries, embassies and consulates, and the right to petition to the European Ombudsman, just to name a few of the rights of the European citizen, only complement the rights and obligations under national citizenship. Similarly, our, our identity as EU citizens cannot result in the dissolution of our identities shaped through our identities as nationals of certain member states, our cultural or historic traditions, social environment and traditional values. What we witness now is that the European Union is building a Europe which denies traditional European values and which is aimed at creating a European demos. Our government and the considerable majority of the Hungarians, however, are convinced that national identity and European citizenship in its original meaning as created by the Maastricht Treaty cannot be divided from each other or be seen as contrary to one another. We believe that being European is an integral part of our national identity. We are Europeans because we are Hungarians. 
and we can only be Europeans as Hungarians. We believe that our colors should be preserved and the slogan unity and diversity should prevail, in which case unity is just as important as diversity. We seek inspiration in the values and principles as a part of our common constitutional heritage, which reinforce the community of member states instead of driving wedges between them. Dear professors, dear colleagues, the third issue I would like to raise today is related to these wedges. The attitude of certain European institutions shows namely in a direction that makes the respectful cooperation of member states and institutions difficult or sometimes even impossible. The treaty, in line with the need for more democratic control and legitimacy, increased legislative powers for the European Parliament. While the idea and the intention behind this decision are welcome, currently we witness that the Parliament is misinterpreting its role more and more. The large majority of MEPs, not the present ones, of course, forget that democratic representation does not equal with political blackmail or ideological pressure. Under the pretext of the values of the EU, they do not demand perfection from themselves, but from others. And they do not forgive weaknesses, errors to anyone but themselves. Being the loudest in the so-called rule of law debates, they are often echoing the ideas and perceptions of largely, largely internationally financed NGOs networks, self-appointed representatives of the citizens, thus resulting in an outsourcing of rule of law and democracy. I was just a remarkable guest uh, for the Stockholm Symposium on Rule of Law. I felt myself like a clinical rabbit because they all were talking about uh, rule of law procedures, Article 7, but it was only me and some Polish colleagues uh, sitting in the audience who has first-hand experience about the real operation of uh, rule of law proceedings. So I started my speech uh, presenting myself as the Article 7 personal coach. So whoever might be in the same shoes uh, in the future, because we never know when this democratic sword is just uh, cast on us. Uh, whenever you will elect a, a conservative government or a sovereignist government, you may be subject to this Article 7 procedure immediately. Uh, then just please turn to me, I have a lot of uh, recipes, how to, how to live with this. Because it is possible actually, it reinforces you and makes you smarter uh, and uh, widens your horizon about uh, rule of law situation all over uh, the continent. The European Parliament, after initiating the Article 7 procedure, do you hear what I'm saying? The European Parliament, an institution, by definition a political institution, decided that we are not a rule of law state. It's already, the, the concept itself is quite contradictory because they are not lawyers. There was a political pro-migration ma majority back in 2008 in the European Parliament who decided with a fake two-third majority, let's see, because uh, votes cast, I think, are yes, no, and abstentions. However, they did not count the abstentions. This is how they achieved the two-third plus. Of course, we challenged in the court. So the court <laughs> decided, which I... I might say, as an outgoing justice minister, is not a nice uh, judgment uh, based on grammatical interpretation because they said abstention is not a vote, but I used to work in the European Parliament for nine years. There is a, there is a button, which is the abstention. So if you cast your vote, you also can abstain. So this is by grammatical interpretation, a vote cast if you abstain. But the court came to a different conclusion and this is how we lost the court case. But it's also very problematic that Article 7 was started uh, by the European Parliament with a questionable uh, procedure how to calculate the votes. And Hungary, on behalf of the, the government on behalf of Hungary, challenged the court, this decision in front of the court. And the whole community, including member states, they just uh, continued the procedure without waiting for the result of the judgment. Is it rule of law? Is it uh, complying with the principles of rule of law or the legal security? They are starting a procedure where still the initiation of the procedure is questionable because after the judgment we subjected ourselves to the to the ruling however they should have been waited for at least two years while the court was deliberating our, our request so there was a political pressure and it is still uh, going on now the commission uh, actually impedes access to eu funds for hungary and now trying to create uncertainty about hungarian presidency of the council so we see the european parliament is always part of the problem not the solution. Although thanks to the soberness of the member states, and I, I'm really thankful for them, it has become very clear recently that the parliament cannot realistically endanger our EU presidency project 
It is also obvious that a political agenda has taken over the role in the functioning of this institution. On the one hand, these phenomena result that there is a tendency in the European Union to build a Europe of the hegemony of opinions. The intention of huge political groups is to create a political environment where Europe is united, not in diversity, but in alignment and self-censorship, this so-called chilling effect. Be good and there won't be any problem. You won't get any articles, you won't get infringement, just align yourself without any question. We Hungarians, however, are on the side of freedom and pluralism, real pluralism. We accept the diversity of worldviews, interests and positions, and we consider it self-evident that we can express and represent our own. It should be also respected, although this is a minority opinion. In our opinion, the future of the European Union depends on its ability to build bridges between those who think differently about Europe and about European integration, bridges, not wedges. On the other hand, the mentioned tendencies confirm that major stakeholders in the European Union are building a Europe without democracy. Under the pretext of achieving the rule of the European people, in fact, the dismantling of European nations' democratic control over EU institutions is taking place. That is what, according to our view, should change. We say no to the outsourcing of the rule of law. We say no to the outsourcing of democratic will and democratic representation to civil society organizations because the elected leaders must be the driving forces of the union, not NGOs that have no political responsibility. We argue that the common European values, including rule of law, shall not only be enforced as regards member states, they are binding to the institutions as well. In this spirit, they should respect the limits of their competencies. They shall act in an objective, non-based manner and prevent arbitrariness in their procedures. The Parliament shall return to its role as representative of citizens instead of intruding into national politics. And finally, due to the current deficiencies in the functioning of the Parliament, we all read the news, we should consider strengthening the role of the national parliaments in the EU-level system of democratic legitimacy and control. So, dear colleagues, my final remarks are coming. A couple of days ago, at the informal meeting, as I already said, in Stockholm, we discussed how the EU could get ready for the future. It was a very valuable discussion in little groups uh, uh, with uh, nine other member states, because we were distributed in groups, uh, us 27 members. And we concluded, what I quoted at the beginning today, we need self-evaluation and honest stock-taking on our results and goals, opportunities and deficiencies in order to be fit for future challenges. Because we have challenges. Maybe in a couple of years, eight new member states will be joining the European Union. First, we should have a stock taking who we are, who are the recipients receiving those new member states. We shall elaborate these solutions as a first option on the basis of the existing treaties. And finally, we shall work in a climate of mutual trust. Honest dialogue is the only way forward. And what I would like to add on this occasion is that despite of all kinds of political and ideological pressure, the Union shall be able to build its future on the basis of its most inherent principles established among others by the Maastricht Treaty. The EU is a community of member states which shall contribute to their success instead of eradicating them. In times of crisis, capable and strong nation states are required alongside the European Union that does not tie them down but provides them real assistance. European democracy can only be secured by strengthening democratically organized national communities. We must create the democracy of democracies. We must protect the European generations of the present and of the futures. And the success of such, such efforts is the precondition for the successful future of the European project. Thank you very much for your attention.